The National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated stations present The Pacific Story. This is the story of the Pacific, the drama of the millions of people who live around this greatest sea, where the United States is now committed to a long-term policy of keeping the peace. This, as another public service of the National Broadcasting Company, is the background story of the events in the Pacific and their meaning to us and to the generations to come. The New Milestone. For the past 25 years, relations between the Chinese and Russians haven't exactly been beer and skittles. They have had plenty to bicker about. The matter of Outer Mongolia, for example, and the matter of the Chinese Eastern Railway, and for that matter, the whole problem of Manchuria, to say nothing of the basic matter of the sovereignty of China itself. But on August 14, 1945, they got together the Russians and the Chinese, and signed a treaty. It's an important treaty in the light of all that's happened and the general setup over there, and it may have a good deal to do with the peace in the Far East for the next generation. That's why statesmen and politicians and soldiers, people like that, may be concerned with it for years to come. And that's why maybe you and I should too. China got the best of a deal. Russia knows what she's doing. Yeah, but look what China got. Russia's got her eye on the future. That gives you an idea. A new epoch is opening in Sino-Russian relations. It could be one of the most important things to come out of the war. It assures China 30 years to work for national reconstruction. That's what the Chinese say. It will prevent the possibility of Japanese aggression. It is for the benefit of the whole world. That's what the Russians say. But world observers see other angles in it. It strengthens Chiang Kai-shek in dealing with the powers that have had interests in China. And it serves notice on them that the day of exploitation of China is ended. Whether the main bones of contention between the Russians and the Chinese can be settled by the signing of a treaty remains to be seen. But the treaty is a new milestone in a quarter of century of alternating friendship and hostility. Until the Russian Revolution in 1917, Tsarist Russia had enjoyed the same sort of rights and benefits in China as the other powers. Extraterritoriality, residential concessions in the bigger Chinese cities, and many others. In 1920, the Russians came to the Chinese. We wish to do all possible to promote friendly relations between China and Soviet Russia. We appreciate your sincerity. We are aware of the difficulty of normal relations between a great nation such as yours and a nation in revolution such as ours. But our own revolution is still not resolved. Your people have been oppressed as ours have. And now, in the sympathy of the Russian people for the Chinese, we renounce all the rights and interests gained in China by Tsarist Russia. Russia is voluntarily giving up all its rights in China? All of them, including extraterritoriality. China is grateful. And we seek most fervently the recognition by China of Soviet Russia. Recognition at this time and under these circumstances is a matter for grave consideration. We must the Chinese ended the extraterritorial rights of the Russians and took over control of the Russian concession, but did not recognize the Soviet Union. Do you know why they didn't, Howell? The observers knew what was happening. The Western powers are putting pressure on China not to recognize the Soviet Union. Why? 
Because the Chinese are looking for help from the Western powers. Yes. And a lot of the Chinese are hoping they're playing the right horse. But I'm not so sure... And now there was another complication. The Russians years before had secured the right to build a railway across Manchuria, the Chinese Eastern. It was a shortcut across Manchuria. It saved more than 300 miles between the interior of Siberia and Vladivostok. Nominally, the Chinese had some say in this operation. But actually, it was run almost entirely by the Russians. Hey, uh, Mr. Howell. Yes? What do you think about the Chinese Eastern? Have the Chinese taken it over? Lock, stock, and barrel. And the Russians trying to be friendly. That's not all. The Chinese are taking a strong stand against the Russians in outer Mongolia. Matter of fact, they're taking a strong stand against them all along the line. It looks to me, Mr. Howell, as if the Chinese are doing everything possible to show that they don't want anything to do with the Soviet Union. And that's what I'm going to cable my paper. Well, what did I tell you, Howell? Just as I said, the Chinese have played the wrong horse. They bet on the Western powers and made no move toward friendship with Russia. And now what? The Western powers give them the cold shoulder and treat them just about the same as they've been treating Soviet Russia. Sun Yat-sen's been pleading for help from the Western nations. And what has he gotten? Russia and China were both left out in the cold. Russia still struggling with its revolution, now four years past, and China still struggling with its own, now ten years past. China turned to Russia. I went up to Peking to have a talk with Adolf Jaffa, who had come as an envoy from Russia. The Western capitalistic countries are imperialistic, Mr. Howell. It is the imperialists that have cut up China. Russia is not imperialist. We wish only friendship with China. The Russians worked to promote good feeling toward Russia. China and Russia were now the outcasts. The Russians worked to show what they had in common. But the Chinese were cagey. Uh, it is true we are neighbors. And our people, as the Russian people, are unhappy and discriminated against. But there is still the danger to us of the communist propaganda. The Russians are not interested in China. They have withdrawn their territorial rights... But there is no assurance that they will not try to infiltrate all China with their ideology. The Western nations will give us no help. No, but if Russia is not interested in spreading the communistic doctrine, then why has she spread it down into outer Mongolia? The Mongols have not tried to resist, as we shall. Besides, this could be the first Russian move to regain control of the Chinese Eastern Railway. The Russians should have some measure of control. China was drifting toward Russia. Sun Yat-sen invited Jaffa southward to Canton. They talked long and intently about their treatment by the Western nations and about what their two nations together with their hundreds of millions could mean. They issued a joint statement. Russia and China are both in the process of resolving the revolutions. Both have gone through great social and political upheavals. Neither Russia nor China now has the sympathy of the great Western powers. Yet, each nation must solve its problems in its own way. Neither the Soviet system nor communism can be successfully introduced into China. China must first be unified and win its complete independence. Further, Russia wishes to reassure China that it has no special interest in outer Mongolia, and it recognizes China's operation of the Chinese Eastern Railway. China and Russia drew together. Jaffa and his successors laid the groundwork for the era of goodwill between the Chinese and the Russians in the early 20s. Then Mikhail Borodin came to Canton as head of the Russian advisorate to Sun Yat-sen. The Guomindang must be solidified into a dynamic force. How are you going to do that, Mr. Borodin? Well, it is a matter of making every individual member more closely a member of the body politic of the party. Well, can that be done with Chinese? The Russians have done it. The individuals must be united by party objectives. Most members of the Guomindang are held together by their loyalty to Dr. Sun Yat-sen. That is not enough. Our people are held by their loyalty to Lenin. 
but in the light of long-range thinking, the party, the objectives of the party are bigger than any man. Then you're planning to model the Chinese Kuomintang Party after the Russian Communist Party. Yes. We must start with the registration of all members of the old party. All members of the old party are registered, Mr. Borodin. We must have them registered again. In this way, we shall be able to separate the sheep from the goats, especially those who are still thinking in terms of the political concepts of ten years ago. Chiang Kai-shek, meantime, was in Moscow. He watched Trotsky's Red Army. He listened to Trotsky. Patience and activity are the two essential factors for a revolutionary party. And the one complements the other. He came back with the Russian ideas. He also came back with ideas of his own. Why did Chiang Kai-shek stay in Moscow only four months? I, uh, I don't know. There must be some reason for it. He might have come back to become head of the Wampo Military Academy. Hmm. Could there have been other reasons? There could. Howell, I have an idea that one of these days we'll be seeing the real reason. A man of Chiang Kai-shek's caliber doesn't... But in 1924, Russia and China signed a convention re-establishing diplomatic and consular relations and stipulated several other things. Russia also agrees to withdraw its troops from outer Mongolia and not to permit propaganda against China. It is further agreed that a conference will be held to settle the question of the Chinese Eastern Railway and to work out... The but details. some professed there were already signs of trouble. Uh, what about it, Mr. Wang? The convention stipulated that the Russians would withdraw their troops from outer Mongolia. But it is true it said nothing to prevent the Russians from maintaining close relations with the Mongol government. And it did not say that the Russians could not uh, advise the Mongols, did it? No, it did not. Then, actually, it did not restore outer Mongolia to Chinese control. Under the tripartite agreement of 1915, Russia agreed that outer Mongolia was to be under Chinese suzerainty. Uh, candidly, Mr. Wang, do you think that outer Mongolia is slipping away from China and toward Russia? Under present conditions, that would be difficult. But if there were some who were doubtful about the trend in Sino-Russian relations... It was crystal clear to others. Chiang Kai-shek was silent. Now Sun Yat-sen was dead. And now Chiang Kai-shek had become chairman of the standing committee of the Guomindang and commander-in-chief of the armies. There is the foundation of China's new army, Baradin. It is easy to see Chiang Kai-shek's hand in it. He is developing here a nucleus of the finest army China has ever had. Yes. This is a modern army organized to operate in a modern way. Are you concerned, Varadin? We are on the best of terms with China. Mm -hmm. But what of Chiang Kai-shek? Well, he stayed only four months in Moscow. We have been here in China more than two years. Yes. Do you think that Chiang is developing this army because of the friction that has developed in Manchuria? Chiang is basically a military man. Varadin... We should be less than astute if we did not take into account that Chang's sympathy is with the right wing of the Guomindong. It is apparent that there is likely to be a struggle for control of the Guomindong now that Sun Yat-sen is gone. There probably will be. Could this new army of his be conceived of as an instrument to gain this control? More than that, if the right wing should prevail... We should probably find ourselves in a difficult position here in China. Oh, here comes one of Chang's officers. Yes. Mr. Boridi, how do these new units look to you? Very impressive. Very impressive. They have been trained according to our new plan. The general should be congratulated. We are working to establish the highest military standard. Yes. This will strengthen Chiang Kai-shek's position. It is General Chang's policy to prepare for all possibilities. We 
saw the writing on the wall. By 1927, the days of Borodin and the Russian advisorate in China were numbered. Chung turned on the left wing of the Kuomintang. He purged the party of the communist Russian influence. The Kuomintang was split wide open. The Chinese communists who had been welcomed into the party were now expelled. Siding with them were many leftists who were not communists. Borodin and the Russian advisorate hurriedly left the country. China had come to the parting of the ways with Russia. Relations between China and Russia worsened. If you ask me, it's a mistake, Howell. Whose mistake? Both China's and Russia's. They're the outcasts of the world. The Western powers are against Soviet Russia on principle, and they've been against doing anything for China. The Western powers are supporting Chiang now. Now, yes, because he's taken a stand against the Soviet Union. But they wouldn't help China in those first years after the war when China was trying to get along without Russia. They're probably glad that Russia and China are split now. Yeah, that's what's too bad. Russia and China should work together. They're neighbors. They're both potentially strong Far Eastern nations. And they can do better working together than opposing each other. And no matter how far a sea... The they Russians can... got out. And Chiang Kai-shek launched his campaigns against the Chinese communists. As Chiang Kai-shek is driving to exterminate the Red Influences, the situation between the Russians and the Chinese is becoming tense. Here in Manchuria, the Chinese and the Russians are openly hostile. There is a widening breach, especially as regards the railway. Both the Chinese and the Russians are accusing the other of violation of the Convention of 1924. Both are moving toward action which may... I went up to Manchuria. No, you cannot go in. You will stand back. Stand back there. Stand back. What's all the excitement about? Stand back there. You cannot go in. Well, here's my pass. I want to go in to see the Russian consul. You cannot go in. Stand back. Stand back. The entire Russian consulate was surrounded by a cordon of Chinese troops. The front door was open. They're raiding the Russian consulate. Raiding it? Yes. A whole squad of stand officers and troops have gone in there. Stand back, stand back. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. But well, why are they raiding it? Looking for papers, I suppose. Documents. Well, look, some of them are coming out. Yeah. See? They're carrying out files make, make and papers. Get back, get back. I'd like to get in there and interview the Russian consul. They wouldn't let you near him. No, you get back there. You cannot go in. Well, I just want to talk with the Russian consul. No one is permitted inside. Stand back. Well, look, stand back. No, they're bringing out the consul. But he must be under arrest. Look at the troops around him. Yeah, and all of his staff. Let They're taking through. in the whole Let caboodle. Stand back there. Let them through. Stand back. Stand back. Let them through. Nobody is on Manchuria was the focal point of the trouble. While this consulate was being raided, the consul and his staff arrested, the same thing was happening in other places. And many other things were happening. The Chinese are moving swiftly against the Russians in Manchuria. The Chinese today took over the telephone and telegraph systems of the Chinese Eastern Railway. <laughs> Sino-Russian relations are deteriorating rapidly. Today in Manchuria, the Chinese closed all Russian organizations in the Chinese Eastern Railway Zone. The Chinese today took over the administration of the Chinese Eastern and arrested more than 200 Russians who had been working on the railway. I talked with one of the Russian staff members. They're making a mistake. They're going too far. How serious do you think this is? The Soviet would almost certainly take similar measures against the Chinese consulates in Russia. But that will not help you Russians as to the Chinese Eastern Railway. No, it will not help us, but it will... Come along with me now. Come along. Do not touch me. I will come. This you should tell your people, Mr. Come along with me. Come along with me. Come along. For months, the situation was explosive. Russia had lost favor in China. But both China and Russia were eager to avoid war. Gradually, the tension eased. By the year's end, they signed an agreement restoring the status quo ante. The Russians retook control of the Chinese Eastern. This is about the only influence Russia has left in China. Except possibly the influence the Soviets have with the Chinese communists. But they're probably not as vital to Russia right now as this railway is. Why do you say that? Russia must have this railway. It's, well, it's a sort of lifeline into Manchuria and a shortcut to Vladivostok. 
And as for the Chinese communists, well, they're scattered in pockets throughout China, and, and they, they, they... Did you two hear the news? Chiang Kai-shek started an extermination campaign against the Chinese communists. What? Uh-huh. He started a full-scale military campaign against them. He's driving them on. But by the time Chiang had started his extermination campaigns, trouble was again brewing in Manchuria. The Russians again had their garrisons there. But this trouble was not with the Russians. The Chinese are committing outrages against Japanese property in Manchuria. This must be stopped. Uh, just what are the Chinese doing? The Ch- oh, This is a matter for Japan and China to settle. Well, if outrages are being committed, it might help to have the world know what is being done and who is doing it. Japan will settle this problem in its own way. We who had been in the Far East knew what that meant. On the chart, the Chinese had removed a portion of rail on the South Manchuria Railway. The Japanese suddenly attacked the Chinese at Mukden last night. They've seized control of the city and are now fanning out in all directions, using the railroad. The Japanese took over Manchuria and then extended their influence out over the provinces of North China. Chung continued his extermination campaigns against the Chinese communists. I talked to leaders of the communists. Who is China's greatest enemy? We communists or the Japanese? Apparently, Chung considers you communists the more dangerous. All Chinese nationalists and communists should unite against the Japanese. Chung should bring this civil war to a close so that we can all work together for the preservation of the nation. What can Chung... The fighting went on. And the Russians played their hand. Well, what do you think of it, Howell? The Russians selling the Chinese Eastern to the Japanese? Yes. They could hardly do anything else after Japan took Manchuria. The heartbreaking thing is that while China and Russia squabble, the Japanese move in and take over the very place they're squabbling over. There's also the matter of the Chinese communists. Well, in a sense, the Chinese communists are better off today than they were before Chong started his extermination campaigns against them. They fought their way from South China up to the Northwest, and now they're closer to Russia than ever before. I say that when China and Russia... The fighting continued, and Russia looked on. The bitterness that had existed between the Chinese and the Russians was gone. But there was no move to bring about more friendly relations. Not even after the kidnapping of Chung in 1936, when the Chinese, including the Chinese communists, agreed upon a united front against the Japanese. Not until the Japanese attacked China at the Marco Polo Bridge, and the nationalists and the communists formed a united front, in fact, did relations between Russia and China improve. These trucks are bringing supplies from Russia. Russia alone in those early days helped China. If we can't get enough supplies, we can defeat Japan. The trucks rolled in with supplies from Russia. Russia is our friend. Russia! Russia! the Russian war materials rolled into China. The Chinese nationalists and communists grew together. But by the time the first phase of the Japanese drive into China was over, the nationalists and the communists again fell apart. How do you think this is going to affect Russia's help to China, Howell? Well, it's not affected it so far. Yes, I've never seen any evidence that the Russians are backing the communists against the nationalists. And even though the communists and the nationalists have split again, Russia is still sending water spies to the nationalists. Now the shoe was on the other foot. What is Russia's attitude toward China? There was no answer from the Kremlin. How does China stand with Russia? There was no answer. In China, in the days of darkest despair, while the Russian might was driving back the Nazis in Europe, the question went unanswered. Russia was no longer knocking at China's door, begging for friendship. In Chongqing, there were many rumors. 
Stalin is more interested in the Chinese communists than in the welfare of the nationalists. He is committed to the policy... Stalin of... is playing for a free-handed Manchuria. He wants to take over the... Entire... Stalin is trying to maneuver a coalition of the nationalist government and the communists so that he will be in a position... When Nazi Germany collapsed, again the eyes of many Chinese were on Russia. I say, Howell, look at this. TV soon is in Moscow. Soon in Moscow? Yes, right now. Yeah. The situation has changed a lot since the Russians came out here after the last war. Any idea what he's talking about? I don't know. But we've got some information that the premier of Outer Mongolia is also on his way to Moscow. Maybe China and Russia... On August 14th, 1945, <clears throat> China and the USSR signed the Treaty of Friendship and Alliance. Soviet Russia agrees to render China moral support and material assistance in the form of military and other supplies. Such assistance to be given exclusively to the national government. Uh, that leaves the Chinese communists out in the cold, doesn't it? In the future, if either party should be again attacked by Japan, the other party will immediately render military assistance to the attacked party. Where? That points a double-barreled gun at Japan. Soviet Russia reaffirms her respect for China's full sovereignty in Manchuria. Well, that settles the matter of territory of Manchuria. But what about the railroads? The Chinese Eastern Railway and the South Manchurian Railway are now combined into one line, known as the Chinese Changchun Railway. It is to be jointly owned and operated by China and the USSR for a period of 30 years. They should have done that years ago. China will recognize the independence of Outer Mongolia if, after a plebiscite, the people of Outer Mongolia confirm that they wish independence. Well, the Chinese themselves say that Outer Mongolia has drifted away from the central government ever since 1914. The port of Dairin in Manchuria is to be a free port, open to the commerce and shipping of all nations. Dairin shall be entirely under Chinese administration. So, the Russians are coming back to the city they started nearly half a century ago. And they're coming back to Port Arthur, too. Port Arthur is to be jointly used as a naval base. The civil administration of the Port Arthur area is to be Chinese. But a Sino-Soviet military commission will be set up to handle matters concerning the joint use of the naval base. Russia and China are once more together. I've seen the complete cycle. China got the best of the deal. Russia knows what she's doing. That's the talk you hear. But a new epoch, a more promising epoch, is opening in Sino-Russian affairs. And it may be one of the most important things to come out of the war. have been listening to The Pacific Story, presented by the National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent stations as a public service to clarify events in the Pacific and to make understandable the cross-currents of life in the Pacific Basin. For a reprint of this Pacific Story program, send 10 cents in stamps or coin to University of California Press, Berkeley, California. May I repeat? For a reprint of this Pacific Story program, Send 10 cents in stamps or coin to University of California Press, Berkeley, California. The Pacific Story is written and directed by Arnold Marquis. The original musical score was composed and conducted by Thomas Peluso. The principal voice was that of Lou Merrill. <laughs> Programs in this series of particular interest to servicemen and women are broadcast overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company.